Earth's magnetic field. When disturbed by the sun, it induces favorable conditions for cyclone intensification and longevity. Years of consistent geomagnetic forcing observations on tropical storms now have an excellent mechanistic explanation. The answer is found at the 500 HPA level of the atmosphere, and slightly around it, around two or three miles up. As you look at Katya, Irma, and Jose from September 2017, Remember that in cyclogenesis, a warm air mass finds equilibrium with a cold air mass and helps fuel the storm and determine its lifetime. This storm engine is strong at this level of the atmosphere. Now, hold that thought as we come down to ground level. All low-pressure cells suck surface air into the vortex, as you can see by the wind vectors coming in there. Once you get up into the clouds, however, the patterns begin to change. The flow is of the same basic pattern, but we do see far less of an intrusion into the vortex. At the upper planetary boundary, we see the pattern begin to reverse as the vortex expands from the small eye near the surface. Above that, we are no longer largely influenced by drag and turbulence, and we're getting close to the stratosphere where once you hit the jet stream level, we can see where all that air from below is going as it is expelled at this level, whereas most surface weather is hiding far below large-scale patterns. On this temperature map in the upper layer, that is why it's warmer in the middle of the cells. The air just came from the warmer surface. Now that we understand the layers of the largest storms on Earth, let's come back to the new discovery. During geomagnetic storms, we see an increase in the temperature of the warm air mass. This drives intensification due to the potential difference with the cold air mass and extends the lifetime by adding fuel to the storm's gas tank. This phenomenon is strongest seen below the jet stream in those middle layers we showed earlier, and again here. Although this is where the action is, it will be vital for the future of this subfield of science to recognize that this would not be as active without the full-scale connection up to the jet stream level. This can bypass the top-down heating mechanism that dominates much of solar forcing science, at least it did before the last few years, and indeed the oncoming looks into the geomagnetic and electric circuit effects over short periods can make much more sense if there is this vertical integration of connectedness in the form of a vortex that maintains direction and flow. The connection exists in most tropical events of requisite strength to qualify as a tropical event. And this is why this is so important. It is a perfectly reasonable and mathematically sound mechanistic explanation for the years of consistent geomagnetic forcing observations on tropical storms. Without question, the mainstream should begin to be watching and waiting for enough data, and perhaps this will end up resulting in a great revelation. However, the temporal correlation implied by this work has been documented documented for years already, and we're about to show it to you here as you watch the background information from previous videos. The big news is that now we understand why this pattern is one that we are seeing. Like how during the relentless six-day geomagnetic storm, Hurricane Ophelia became the strongest East Atlantic hurricane on record just a little bit earlier this month. The only question now is, has this ever happened before? The Sun and Storms, an easy topic for discussion at present. For months, the Sun has been showing its solar minimum trend, including numerous zero sunspot days and depressed solar flaring activity. Then, after the sunspots began appearing again in mid-August 2017, they surged to life as September turned and released numerous X-class solar flares and solar wind shock waves called CMEs. These eruptions rank high for the solar cycle and on the historical records, and in their wake we have seen the Atlantic come alive to where on September 8, 2017, there are now three storms in the Atlantic Basin on the heels of Hurricane Harvey's attack on Texas. Indeed, it was a lackluster Atlantic storm season until girt in the middle of August. Then, as the month ended and September turned, we saw a surge in hurricane activity, including at least three major ones and Category 5 Irma, which surged to peak strength during the solar events. Looking more long-term at the sun, we see we have solar flares up top, then sunspot number, then proton radiation and cosmic rays at the bottom. Sunspot number second from the top is where we focus. The ramp up after extended quiet began in mid-August, just as GERT was churning, but it wasn't until the ramp up higher that we saw the extreme intensification of the Atlantic season. Peaking so far this first week of September as the solar flares, sunspots, and geomagnetic storms peaked as well. Now, 
One season of temporal correlation is not a model, or even a pattern. We need a longer time of examination. Luckily, this examination is ongoing. We've been at it a while. And what follows is our presentation of this material two years ago, along with updates from the interim time between. And so let's take a look at what happens when the sun fires off and when the sun affects Earth in terms of the tropical activity. Well, you'll remember this from yesterday morning. The KP8, the level four geomagnetic storm of this summer, was followed just days later by six cyclones popping up in the Pacific. And that one just to the northeast of Hawaii did not hit uh, the requisite strength to be classified in this way or else it would have been the first time in recorded history of there being seven in the Pacific. As I mentioned earlier, this was also the earliest example of three typhoons forming in the Western Pacific. Let's move on and take a look at some of the other things that have happened just this season. And these things are, and when I say this season, I mean this tropical season this year. The Northwest and the Central Pacific seasons are smashing record activity. They have sort of calmed down in the last few weeks, but as of late August, the records for activity in the Northwest and the Central Pacific were obliterated. We also have record super typhoon formation in the Northern Hemisphere just this summer. We had four tropical cyclones at once in just one section of the Pacific two different times. It happened in the Southwest Pacific uh, and actually the Indian Ocean was involved. Remember when all those cyclones were surrounding Australia? Uh, in the morning news I said they've got them surrounded. And it also happened in the Northwest Pacific as well. Hurricane Fred in the Atlantic is the easternmost tropical hurricane formation in the history of the Atlantic Ocean as far as we know. For the first time ever, we had three Category 4 hurricanes in the Central Pacific. And we had Hurricane Joaquin, which missed landfall by a good way and still managed to produce a thousand year flood in South Carolina at the same time that that October Medicane, which is a Mediterranean hurricane, uh, was pounding Italy, pounding France. And interestingly, all of these events match up with the space weather events that we've seen this summer. But rather than go and sort of look deeper at each one of these, I'm going to pick some specific extreme examples of space weather induced uh, activity. And before I do that, you see all of these records ha falling this year. And on this list, it's not even the occurrence of those, those six Pacific cyclones at one time. Any one or two of these things happening in a season really isn't that big of a deal. But when you get all of these things happening in one season, you kind of have to start to pay attention and say, well, this season is not really what we're used to. And so you might ask the question, well, hey, isn't this the effect of global warming we're seeing? Or isn't this the effect of El Nino? This is the kind of thing we would expect. Well, if the tropical events were sort of just randomly dispersed across the time frame, you might be able to say, yes, this is global warming. Yes, this is El Nino. But when these things so clearly match a space weather induced disaster scenario, you might want to start to think that maybe Earth's magnetic shield is not doing so well and this is having effects on things that affect us like the weather. So we had the six tropical cyclones in the Pacific. That was the KP8 in late June of 2015. October 1, remember we talked about this, the kill shot misses. That was when Hurricane Joaquin formed, and we had the Medicaid over in the Mediterranean. In 2013, we had an X-class flare and magnetic crochet, very rare event. This is when the solar flare is so powerful that strong electric currents actually get surged through Earth's atmosphere. Now, this happens when the CME impacts Earth the auroral electrojet starts firing up with the northern lights and that induces currents. To have it from the flare itself is very rare. We call that a magnetic crochet. It hasn't happened but for a handful of examples. And just days later we have Typhoon Haiyan. Now when you talk about 
the the typhoon records that are, are the big boys, you know, strongest storm, lowest pressure, fastest winds, largest area. Every single one of those big time typhoon records are held by either Haiyan or typhoon tip, which occurred in October at the exact peak of sunspot activity back in 1979. And Although we don't know what the flaring was like, we have some idea of what the auroras were like, we can say definitively that for the year 1979, statistically the greatest chances for significant space weather occurred at the exact time Typhoon Tip formed. So, can you guys all see the timestamp down there? Is that sticking out to you guys at all? So we had very, very quiet space weather actually for days and days and days. And then, all of a sudden, the sun woke up like crazy. A ton of CMEs. Now, none of them were coming at Earth, but these were the type of tight, coiled CMEs that, uh, that you often see um, really perturbing the inner heliosphere. And of course, this occurred, as I heard somebody say, exactly at the start of Hurricane Katrina. And it ended right about the time it hit its peak strength. The last time we had an X10 solar flare or higher was just a few days after that event that caused Katrina, and that was an X17. And the mid-month storm outbreak was the very last time before this summer that we had five Pacific cyclones at the exact same time, a very significant outbreak. The last time we had a near major solar flare was an X9 in 2006. We had the Hanukkah Eve cyclone strike Washington. If anybody's familiar with that, it was one of the strongest storms to ever hit the state of Washington. And to set a rain record in Seattle is no small feat, I have to tell you. Um, <laughs> so um, interestingly, that sort of very odd track that that Hanukkah Eve storm took is very similar to Oho which formed at the exact same time as Joaquin and the Medicaine. And this is what Dr. Uyen mentioned, and it took a track that was very, very similar to the Hanukkah Eve storm. It hit the Canadian coastline a bit further north, but it's very interesting to see two very rare storms, and this late in the season, you don't see a Pacific hurricane swing up and go at BC like that, British Columbia, and we've seen it twice immediately after significant solar events. Hurricane Sandy. This was about the only solar uptick for about a month before or after Hurricane Sandy. And it just sort of came and went in the period of a week where out of nowhere we jumped up from B and C class flares up to M and X class solar flares, including a very large coronal mass ejection, which was not aimed at Earth, but as we've learned, they don't have to be aimed at Earth to perturb us. And that was, of course, when Hurricane Sandy sort of came up and did its thing, and it was the largest Atlantic storm ever by gale diameter. So, let's come back to this. And I was speculating that the melted power line and the electrical explosion just a few miles away uh, in Washington state, along with the transformer fire in India, were very good candidates for space weather induced disruptions on the ground. Now, wouldn't it be great if we didn't have to speculate, if the atmosphere could give us a hint, anything to tell us that, hey, wait a minute, yes, there is a disruption in that particular part of the world. Washington State and India. Well, Mumbai is where, where the transformer uh, blew, is directly to the uh, east of that cyclone that formed that day in the Northwest Indian Ocean. And that was the tropical storm we just mentioned coming up towards British Columbia. Those were, at that time, two of the more significant tropical events on the planet. And just to the east of each of them is where we saw the best candidates for the space weather induced activity. So both, both the melted power line and, trans, and uh, electrical explosion at the dam and the transformer fire in India occurred concurrent with the storm effects 
while these tropical storms, these atmospheric disturbances, were nearby. Here we go back with that coincidence thing again. October 22nd, 2015, the week after this presentation, after a few weeks of low solar activity, we got a long duration solar flare in CME. It arrived at Earth just two days later on October 24th, and within that short duration, Hurricane Patricia surged to become the strongest storm ever recorded on Earth, and the second strongest in terms of pressure intensity. The sun went silent for one week, and so did the Earth. Then, a set of M-class flares produced twin cyclones back-to-back -back that hit the Middle East in one of the rarest weather events in recent memory. Flare, storm, flare, storm. The next significant weather event came on January 11, 2016, when Polly became the earliest Central Pacific cyclone formation on record, all while Alex was becoming a rare January hurricane in the Atlantic. After weeks of solar calm, an M-class solar flare the first week of the year was followed by a coronal hole stream impact and geomagnetic storm that lit up the skies over Finland on that very same January 11th. We waited a month for the sun to get active again, but it did so February 18th, just as auroras broke out across the polar region due to a coronal hole stream in the solar wind, and the sun kept firing. Within 24 hours of the solar uptick and Earth effects, Cyclone Winston became the strongest cyclone to make landfall in the recorded history of the South Pacific Basin. March was quiet. April was too, until out of nowhere an M6 solar flare erupted on April 18th, the largest of 2016, and caused a radio blackout at Earth. Within 24 hours, Cyclone Fantala was the strongest storm in the history of the Indian Ocean. That makes the strongest storm in the East Pacific, which was the strongest on record worldwide, the strongest to make landfall in the South Pacific, and the strongest in the Indian Ocean all since late October 2015, and the last two coming just here in 2016, and all during significant solar events. There were many more examples, including during the last Level 4 geomagnetic storm in June 2015. Records fell for fastest-paced and record-breaking storm seasons, and major storms occurred out of season and in unusual locations, all in the last 12 months. We saw this with major historical events as well. However, now it appears that Earth's weakening magnetic field is allowing weaker and weaker solar activity to disrupt our planet more and more often, to the point where the strongest storms on record are occurring at astonishing rates.